Okay, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for coming along to this CDN session, which they're hosting today for us on the virtual bridge. And um, with me, uh, I'm Ian Beach, HMI, and I've got a colleague, Barbara Nelson, with me. Um, and also we have Dumfries and Galloway College, represented by uh, Mandy and um, Angela. So what we're going to do today is talk through one section of a report that was um, released just about a, just over a week ago. So next slide, please, Andrew. So the session is aimed to um, look at this report um, in terms of the lessons learned from the work that we've been doing, the post-16 team, around remote learning in colleges. And um, part of that report also identifies best practice. And as I mentioned, Dumfries and Galloway um, are, are here to talk about one element of that best practice, which is delivering um, skills in ICT for staff. Next slide, please, Andrew. So the purpose of the report that was published um, was to give an overview of learner and staff experiences, trying to share what is working well, identify any challenges and actions or recommendations for improvement. All of the colleges in Scotland participated. Um, we had five themes um, and around five colleges participated in each theme. But across the um, evidence gathering, we managed to speak to nearly 500 college staff and managers and 180 learners. Next slide, please, Andrew. Although there were five elements, we've actually got six sections in the report because one part of that stood out in terms of digital infrastructure once we'd finished gathering our evidence. Um, the others were planning, remote learning and teaching, which is what we're gonna look at today. Um, engagement of learners in remote learning, monitoring and assessing learner progress, the assurance of quality in remote learning and the well-being of learners and staff. And each of these sections is being presented on the um, virtual bridge by my colleagues uh, who were lead writers for each of the sections. And I was lead writer for um, learning and teaching and, and Barbara supported that. So these are our findings um, in maybe a little bit more detail than in the report. Um, and also, as Andrew said, there's opportunities at the end to maybe uh, have a chat or, or questions about some of the more, more of the detail. Okay, next slide. Thank you, Andrew. So in terms of what's working well, I think overall the, the balance was um, of things that were working particularly well and the way that colleges had, had really stepped up to a very, very sudden change in delivery that had been around for, for, for many, many years. Um, the use of asynchronous and synchronous delivery came out as a, as a strength. There was overall quite a good balance of asynchronous and synchronous. And this was meeting the learning styles of learners. In particular, the, the fact that um, some evidence and some um, sort of materials, uh, assessment evidence and materials could be uploaded at times out with normal class times was particularly helpful to learners. Um, and some of the little things we forget about um, sort of car parking, um, the cost of childcare, trying to maybe mix and match a, a job with learning, sort of that asynchronous approach and combination with synchronous delivery really helped learners to engage uh, remotely. And they found that very, very beneficial. So that that's really leads to the flexibility of maybe going forward, it would be helpful to include some of that flexibility in in our delivery um, you know, uh, in, in the, of the curriculum as we go forward. That sort of ability to study at their own pace and have those other issues, those life issues sort of um, minimized was, was really helpful. We did find, and we were pleased about this, um, the sort of differentiation and deeper learning that was achieved through remote learning. This sort of learner-centered approach where everybody feels that they're perhaps being spoken to through the camera, through that lens um, individually, but also having that backup of being able to contact the, the lecturer, teaching staff, maybe support staff on an individual basis at a, at a, a later point. 
So that it was a, a good combination of being able to talk about the learning, develop the learning, but also have the support through either the chat function, peer support through the chat function, or directly from the college. And as the time progressed, we found that um, teaching staff increasingly adopted more creative delivery styles. Um, the flipped classroom approach was particularly useful to learners where um, materials were uploaded to the VLE, um, maybe tasks were set, the, the, the individuals could attempt the tasks or look at the materials and then come together as a group to, uh, to actually get more detail about the tasks, see how well they've done, maybe breakout rooms started to come on online after maybe six to, to nine months of, of the pandemic as well. So teaching staff were really adapting and improving their approaches as things progressed. And the feedback to learners also on their assessment and their progress improved as, as we went through the, the sort of pandemic timing um, with video feedback coming on stream, um, different, you know, group feedback, individual feedback, written feedback, uploading that material, um, again, for learners to access when, when they wish to. Next slide, please, Andrew. What was particularly apparent was the way that learners could recognize the range of skills that they were developing. Um, I don't think that was something that came out initially, but uh, this is something that both the learners and colleges picked up on as time went on that although learners felt a little bit shortchanged initially by not having that uh, real life experience, the, the ability to, to mix with their peers on campus, um, what they did realize they were developing was these other subject, um, in addition to their subject related skills, was things like how to use digital technology remotely, maybe have or undertake interviews or, or questions remotely, um, and the digital skills that they were developing, which I think we found, you'll see in the next section, were a little bit surprising to find that some of these skills uh, younger learners didn't actually have. So that um, development of these other skills, in addition to their core and employability skills and all these other things, are really helping learners as they go forward, um, as they now may have to either deliver themselves, uh, uh, deliver sort of presentations themselves online, or undertake an interview online or join in um, with meetings online. We also found a good use of virtual events. So as we all know, getting maybe guest speakers to colleges, um, traveling maybe overnight stays um, was, was particularly difficult. And you may only get through one or two classes in a day with a guest speaker, whereas guest speakers could beam in from their, for their own location and get to quite a good number of learners uh, over about one or two hour period. Um, so the virtual events, virtual tourist attractions and, and the ideas that colleges came up with to sort of expand um, how, they, how they would use the um, periphery of learning and teaching in, in terms of enhancing that experience. Uh, in terms of staffing, there was a lot of um, effort went into identifying what sort of ICT support, support staff was needed, but also in terms of um, teaching staff. So helping teaching staff create online resources, using the new technologies, getting to grips with them, and then moving that across into their, their pedagogy. And the CLPL training, which we'll hear about from Dumfries and Galloway later, um, we found significantly increased staff confidence um, in the learning and teaching and assessment strategies that are needed for online learning. Um, and that sort of filtered through to the well-being side of our evidence gathering, where we found that where training had been delivered successfully, that increase in, in confidence helped with the well-being and, and reduced the anxiety of staff. Next slide, please, Andrew. In terms of um, what were the main challenges, I'm sure people will recognize these particularly around practical um, tasks, obviously SVQs, apprenticeships, these were very, very difficult to, to achieve. And where technical equipment or space for me movement, such as sport and drama was required, extremely difficult. We did hear some interesting get, get arounds for this. Um, I heard about one lecturer who was a gas installer 
and he was taking his own boiler apart at home to um, demonstrate to learners and then putting it back together. Um, another where, where um, I think it was jewelry making colleges were set, the college was sending out the, the um, materials for, for the learners to, to sort of undertake at home and then video their, what, what they'd achieve. I'm sure there's many more, but those are a couple of good examples where colleges started to begin to, to get around some of the technological issues. Uh, I mentioned before about the underestimation of digital capabilities. It, it, it appears that um, younger learners, you know, we may have guessed this perhaps, but aren't that familiar still with VLEs, with um, maybe uploading documents to emails. They're quite familiar with the chat facilities, which is similar to sort of WhatsApp and other social media sites. So colleges are now looking to bridging courses, uh, maybe a very short bridging course to make sure coming into the new session um, that there is um, this capability, but also maybe trying to catch this at induction. So if they haven't got a bridging course, really focusing on induction to make sure the cap capabilities of staff are there, as well as our learners are there. But also thinking at the other end of the spectrum with the, the more mature learners, they had different sets of needs. Um, so across the piece, really, that underestimation was quickly overcome. And I think colleges are now working on, on getting around that sort of those issues. Um, this is a theme really in terms of the engagement of younger learners at FE level. And we had in the engagement part of the, the report talked about whether cameras should be on or off and how discouraging it is for a member of staff to prepare a, a, a presentation or a lecture and be faced with maybe 16 blank screens. Um, so that's something colleges are, are looking at, I think, going into the new session, maybe in terms of protocols for whether or not you, your camera should be on and off. And obviously we understand why in some cases people wouldn't want their camera to be on. And I think everybody's feeling this sort of lack of social interaction particularly from lecturing staff and learners um, who would normally be sort of interacting. Um, and that's a very difficult thing to achieve, although there's been good use of quizzes and get togethers and celebrations and all sorts of things, online graduations, et cetera, but it's still very challenging. Next slide, please, Andrew. Um, it came through about the awarding bodies in general. This has been very difficult, and I think it still is for some colleges to try to deal with um, the awarding body guidance and indeed the, the guidance around COVID distancing is still challenging some colleges as, as we speak today, not knowing how to plan for the, for the next session. Um, digital poverty, um, and that's not just around devices, um, but if colleges recognise that to start with and, and also sent out Wi-Fi devices but it, it's perhaps a little bit more than that in terms of devices, connectivity, and the use of digital equipment. So I think that will still be an ongoing challenge in the new session. In terms of um, learners managing their own learning, um, goes back mainly to the full-time FE sort of uh, cohort, but it's this um, area around independent learning skills and self-discipline. Um, you know, making sure that you're logged on at a certain time and that you, you do really have to, you know, make sure that you engage properly with, with online learning to get the best out of it. And I mentioned the cameras on, off, uh, just there, in terms of some form of approach across the college sector. Next slide, please, Andrew. In terms of further support that colleges were looking for, obviously a, a continuing um, investment in digital equipment and connectivity to allow, as we get into the new session, um, learners to engage, because most colleges, are, well, I think every college is talking about some form of remote delivery going forward. Um, the area around supporting um, digital skills um, to help raise their skill level, but also that could be a confidence issue. If they feel that they haven't got the skills, they may well start to, to either lose interest or, or or uh, um, exit the course early. Um, a definite call for clear, timious and unambiguous guidance from all awarding bodies. And the sharing of best practice, um, which is included in our report. I've got the links at the end. We have our report, then we have some best practice and cameos 
in a separate document for people to look at. I'll maybe just pause there and see if Barbara, if you'd like to, to come in and add anything to, to that sort of presentation. No, I think you, you've covered it. I think there's uh, quite a lot of questions still around in terms of, I suppose, defining what we mean by um, engagement through the cameras, cameras off. Um, also, I would have added perhaps into the additional skills, the recognition that for a lot of learners now, uh, recognise that they have learned much deeper independence in learning, that they are much more self-rated um, and they're taking much more responsibility for their own learning as and when it's right for them to learn. That's all I would add. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Well, ne Next slide, please, Andrew. So these, the, the, a few, several more recommendations within the report, but I pulled out the ones relating particularly to um, learning and teaching. So the issue around digital poverty, I know some colleges are struggling to get back devices that they handed out last year. How is that all gonna work? This is a very new issue for colleges to deal with. But um, overall, I, I think we found that colleges you know, made a very good job of getting as much digital equipment and connectivity out there. Um, but there's still gonna be some more work to be done and that will, that will actually require ongoing funding. And in terms of the different cohorts, I mentioned full-time FE programs in particular, and maybe some of the school link um, courses. So, you know, rather than maybe the approaches that were used to engage as many people across all cohorts as possible, it may be now that colleges will need to start differentiating different types of approaches for different cohorts, full-time, part-time FE. We found on the flip side that HE learners, maybe a little bit unsurprisingly, you know, did engage particularly well in remote learning and progressed well and, and, and were successful in many of their uh, outcomes. So maybe that's a call there for looking at the, the differentiation of approaches. And the other one, these are the, the national recommendations pulled from the report, is in, in terms of ensuring that staff have the skills required to deliver learning and teaching and support um, learning remotely. And again, we, we use quite often the terms overall or almost all or a few. And across what we found, although it was generally a very positive picture, um, there's obviously some people really flying with this and doing it um, almost taken very easily to it and doing very well. And there are still some staff that are tending to struggle, not able to either you know, use the technology appropriately or think about how they might deliver their lessons online. So that last one is really the, the theme now of our best practice. Um, so if you go into the next slide, please, Andrew. So as part of our evidence gathering, we found best practice across all of those themes that we mentioned at the start. Um, and Dumfries and Galloway had um, taken this up. Like many colleges, we, I know virtually every college has got at some form of tailored CLP program. But um, this one particularly um, drew our interest in terms of the way it was differentiated and the way that it was delivered. So I'm gonna pass now over to, to Mandy Wallace from Dumfries and Galloway College. She's supported by Angela. Angela's checking the, the chat for any um, questions or comments. So if you'd like, you have to do, if you do have a question, maybe put a cue in front of it so that we can try to pick them up at the end. Um, but I'll hand over now to Mandy. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. I'm just going to share my screen with you. Can you see that? Okay. Can somebody. It's just coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, to be honest, we didn't think we did anything different to anybody else. We reacted and we've been reactive for all the months that we were in lockdown. Um, what happened was on the Tuesday of the week before lockdown, all the managers were put into a room and I was asked what platforms we would recommend that were used and they would be the platforms that we stuck with. So the decision was it was going to be Teams for communication only and it would be our Moodle for assessments, materials, learning content, any submissions 
um, that had to come in would all be done through our uh, Moodle platform. And we, of course, we would be using Office 365. It quickly became apparent that just using Teams for communication only wasn't going to be good enough because Moodle hasn't got the facility to enable us to get our students to collaborate with each other. So we decided to use Teams for communication and collaboration. So the theme for us was keep it simple. You know, this is what we support. This is what the college supports. These are the three platforms that we're going to use. And that's only the training that we will provide. We wouldn't provide training on, sorry, we're, I know that we're using Zoom, but we've got such a small team. We didn't have that luxury to say, oh, we'll have an expert in Zoom and we'll have an expert in Google. So after that meeting, I met up with my learning teaching mentors. We've got three learning teaching mentors at the moment, but we did have a few more um, when we first went into lockdown. And Angela is one of them. And I very quickly outlined to them what we would be asking staff to do. Now, I'm sure we are not the only college who never used Teams previously. You know, we had been, like us as a team, had been playing about with it with our Stranraer campus, but we never like really investigated its capabilities or anything like that. So what the learning and teaching mentors did was they were holding sessions over lunchtime over the next few days to prepare staff so that they could go home and connect with students from Monday morning um, with the students that had devices that was. So they worked through their lunchtime, they worked through the workrooms, they just wandered the workroom rooms and asked anybody if they needed any help. The priority at that time was to make sure that the staff could still function at home. So every file that we have saved on our home drives in the college that they were going to be using for teaching was getting through, we showed them how to transfer their files onto OneDrive so that they could access that from home, no problem. Because at that point we didn't have VPN set up. And then after that, once everybody knew how to transfer their files, we created videos and things for anybody who missed the learning, teaching, mentor input. And then we moved on to Teams. And when I say Teams, it was very basic Teams. This is how you turn it on. This is how you get your students in there and invite your students in there. And that was how we went for, I would say, the first three to four weeks of lockdown. So we finished on the Friday, the same as everybody else. And if I say we never, oh, sorry, I forgot to move my slide along. We never missed the beat. We finished on the Friday and we were connecting with students on the Monday. And if we couldn't get our students on, then the learning and teaching mentors contacted each individual student to talk them through the whole process. So they weren't just doing CPD, with staff, they were doing one-to-one -one sessions to make sure that the staff were connecting with their students and inviting as many students in as they possibly could. They were also working with students as well to get them on. They were trying to reduce the risk because everybody at that stage was scared. We didn't know what was in front of us. So the basic training for the teams was very, very basic to start off with. But once confidence started to grow, started to grow then that's when the learning and teaching mentors devised a beginners, intermediate and advanced training. And that training, and Angela, you can come in at any time, but that training run right through to the summer and then we had the summer break. And then it, we did that, we repeated that training twice in the month of August before classes started again. So that staff were more and more confident, got more and more confident with their ability to use Teams. And then following the Teams training, we started to get requests for Moodle training, very basic again, starting at the very basic. And as, as staff's confidence started to grow, then they started to ask for more further training and what's the capabilities of Moodle. If I say that we've had, um, I would recommend, I would say that we have came seven years in the space of a year with training for digital skills. I'm the e-learning development manager at the college and to get staff to attend CPD events, to try and bring up digital skills or any kind of pedagogy training, it was really, really difficult to get a good attendance. But we've had such good attendance at all of our sessions and the feedback has been 
amazing for the team. Um, and so the, the feedback was so great. Word of mouth had spread and we delivered the beginners, intermediate and advanced training to the NHS as well to help them with their delivery um, for some of their units that they deliver in-house. Um, at the end of every training session, we, not to begin with, but later on, we started to um, have open forums. So we would have like a week of training of intermediate, and then we would have one session where anybody could come along and just voice what they want to do or find out what somebody else is doing. It's really like more a sh shared best practice forum so that people could learn from each other. And they, I have to say, one of our, like, our VP, Douglas Dixon, came to one of them sessions and it was so valuable because he was there, he was listening to what the staff's concerns were or what the best practice was, but then he could quickly answer some questions as well. And he said that he would come along to any of the other um, open forums that we have following any kind of training. But we didn't just concentrate on Teams and Moodle. We also created um, two-minute CPDs uh, to, to showcase new technologies that could enhance the learning experience, like Sakuhut, Padlet, um, all these kind of things that we could use within Teams and within Moodle as well. Um, the learning and teaching mentors worked very closely. They have, we only have three mentors at the moment, but they worked very closely with their curriculum teams. There would be the odd lecturer who was finding it very difficult to work on teams and to, to get their point across with their students. And the mentors will do one-to-one -one training or they'll do, if it's a common theme, they'll hold a session. Um, and they do that off their own back. They'll come back, they'll feed back and they'll say, do you know, I think we should hold a session on this. And that's where I will put it out, I'll, I'll advertise it, people will book on and the mentors just run with it. The two, P, two minute CPDs, we use ClickView for that and we create a video, a CPD video, and we run it through ClickView and we advertise it on our admin net, which is our intranet. And at the end of each video, it asks you if you want further training on this. So it would give you, um, a quick introduction to using word processing, but using the dictate function. And if anybody wanted further training on that, we would contact them either directly and do one-to-one -one training. But if we have more than five people, we would hold a session because there was a demand for that. And that kind of, the, the CPD videos do feed into what we do for our CPD moving forward for the rest of the year. Um, the learning teaching mentors also held sessions on not, as I say, not just teams, but break, how to break your lessons into manageable chunks, um, flipped classroom, just as what Ian had said earlier on. We were using, if I say we were using breakout rooms before breakout rooms were introduced, we were using, Angela, what's the name? Channels. Channels. We were using channels previously as breakout rooms. Um, and then they introduced breakout rooms, which was ideal. Um, adaptations to assessments, because um, one area would be getting loads of adaptations and how are they going to cope with this? So the mentors would work with them doing that as well. Um, we also did sessions on collaboration and engagement using Teams. It's how do you know that your students are engaged? Do you ask them to participate and give them a thumbs up? if they agree with something, you know, just kind of quick evaluations throughout sessions. Um, Andrew, have you got any um, examples of that? I think you use um, the, the insights as well, which is a really good plug-in to see how many people are engaging because it might not always be face-to-face, -face, so it might be later on that the people come on if, if they've got care responsibilities and it's, it's, uh, that kind of idea. But yeah, we had a lot of collaboration and engagement ideas, like you said, using Padlet and using the breakout rooms and then feeding back and peer evaluations. And from that, we got to know them as well. And I we the so I just think we're coming to the end of the recorded yeah. session. Mandy, so if you just want to wrap that little bit up. Yeah, I'll just, we had a showcase sharing best practice and it was staff who were using technology that they've never used before. So we encouraged them to showcase that at the end of the year conference. 
moving forward, our CPD will be done virtually because we've had the best attendance ever. And at, at the beginning, you could understand it was because of the lockdown, but that attendance has still continued on. They're really interested in what we've got to show them. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. And I know that we're going to be asking if anybody's got any questions. Thanks, Mandy. Sorry to just sort of rush that last bit, but um, all these slides are available um, if, if anybody wishes to have them. So if we just go maybe to my last slide very quickly, Andrew, um, and that gives you the, my contact details, Barbara's contact details, and Angela and, um, and Mandy. So if you want to contact us, that's not a problem out, outside of this, um, this webinar. And also it gives you the link to the report um, and the cameos that I mentioned. So, so these slides can be made available to, to anyone um, that wishes to have them. It's just the very last slide. We do have a few questions on the chat, folks. Yeah. So I think we're just going to come to the end of that recorded session now. So I'll pause and then we'll move on to the questions. Thank you.